So we're going to start by doing a five-minute meditation, just very simple uh, breathing meditation to get centered and grounded. Sim. <laughs> Dutchie <laughs> The <laughs> Tambo same demo near Tablum Tigs, you go to Gumdi, Taco, Set and Demba, you turn in the Gallani, Lisam Shinjang Diwale, Lisam Shinjang Lady, Tobung, Lead on Semi Shinjang. Take a lagger than Lead on Semi Lirum, Takawala Pitch you than the Susan Ramator, Lead on Semi Gala, Kalimioch. Tidding on Lani, you chicken on as an any tongue of long tongue lady, Nibuji reality, New Nilly in toilet in the chair. And then I was just on a touch some money. Yamu, you devote, wing your own lady. Did Tablum Chile. Tango wing your wig lady, Chita Tandela, wing your own gumgue, Jim Sechikarilan, wig lady on the summer to my night, Dutch, she don't think the same show Jambak and Jangamare. Till a pentachi, your mother Chita, Gumja, Tambo, Kari Gum and Gure, in a wig gumgue, the wig latani, Dutch, and she don't think Jongamesa, was a wig, a wing your own titus and damn and they win Jong Gunting on the country's children at Loro Gutrix. Then I Yuani Yasum, and you Yumbani Masum, Yan Yumbani Yasum, Yuani Masum, and each Chanim Yasum Masum, Loro Gutrix. Did it. Do Zinta, did you go to the Churan Gari Hago Gurana? Long the Yan Tendigala, Churan Long Yat Tengiati, Surgur. Long Chikugan, Nogunala, Wit Chikugan. Ma tanti kanda chong kanda long di ma tangi yo ti chiku kanda sam no ta o tu si ta ta na kanda mundu tu si gumgi yo ani longu guti na la la niamli chia mo bishu yo re karji la na ta kanda di shijir la are na kena re na chiri tonle sa wala yo chiri kunzu ti kari chiri la na wun jongo ngun na la la su tu na za ti tonle chiri yo tangu mi jamba na za ti ya le ani kali kali su su zupo la le ani su su zupo ni ma tang. Tizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizimitizim
He said that um, the basic, I will just talk about a brief, very brief, yeah, just a summary. Uh, he said that uh, when we breathe, uh, the basic meditation, when you breathe, that you have to focus on the air that you are inhaling. Only focus on that air, not, nothing else. So, and then when you exhale the another, then you have to focus on that exhale air. This is the basic one. And, uh, and he said, and uh, another important thing is that uh, the main important for the meditation is that you have to focus and more focus on mind. This is the main purpose of meditation so that you can practice your mind to get a better attention and so that you can't distract in the, yeah, and to control the mind. Who's familiar with meditation? Raise your hand if you're familiar with it. Uh -huh. okay. Raise your hand if, you, if you're familiar or if you do meditation once in a while. Okay, so. Okay, so, so we're going to do a five-minute uh, meditation, and actually, by by doing this, you're you're laying very strong foundation for teacher self-care. So this practice is very important for you, and also it will have an impact on your students. Thank you. So who wants to summarize this for me? Somebody else? Okay. Good afternoon all. Uh, our, <coughs> our, Kela, our teachers say that before going to meditation, uh, I mean, it's the traditional way to uh, introduce uh, what is a meditation. So uh, he uh, talked about the uh, Sem and Semchung. There are uh, 51 uh, types of Sem and Semchung. Uh, it's, uh, it's a type of mind. So, <clears throat> and uh, I'm just a little bit nervous. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay. And he, uh, uh, he said that, uh, so when we meditate, he just summarized it. Uh, when he, uh, when we just meditate for five minutes, right? So we have uh, two problem. Uh, the one is that we, uh, the one is that uh, there's a problem of uh, uh, what uh, we we have so many monkey minds that the thoughts comes arise and the the. The other other one is that uh, 
uh, we have a fear of uh, feeling asleep. So there is true problem. So we have to uh, recognize this true problem, he said. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> OK. So when we do uh, meditation, when we practice mindfulness, which domain of the three domains that we saw yesterday are we in? Which domains are we practicing? Me domain. And, and so this is a very important practice. And in, uh, in the school where I work, we engage children. We, we do very uh, short meditation. Actually, sometimes we go up to five minutes in kindergarten even. But this is a practice we do. We don't do it all the time, but this is something important and something you should practice also. Um, I'm going to start today. We're, we're going to talk a lot about uh, the me domain. And I'm going to explain the tools that we use at school to train emotional literacy. And after that, we're going to talk about your own feelings and needs, <laughs> because you're going to have to start practicing from today. OK? Um, first thing I think I want to introduce is the thermometer. I'm going to put it on the board. So the first part of the emotional awareness bit, the self-awareness, which is emotional awareness, is taking one temperature. So it's not about feeling hot or cold, you can imagine. It's about trying to go look inside ourselves how we're feeling right now. And for children, it's really useful to use these images. I'm going to maybe, you know what, uh, if you can share, I don't have so many, but maybe you can pass them around and look. Uh, I'll give one at the back. So the first thing we do is we explain to children and adults, because I have to explain to my teachers, that emotions are like energies that we feel inside our bodies. Sometimes it's very high energy, moves very fast like volcano, about to explode. So can you name one emotion that would be close to a volcano for you? Any idea? Anger, that's a very good one. Um, so the family of anger, frustration, uh, irritation, this goes in the volcano and it's a spectrum. You know, so you could be super angry, that's like the real big about to explode volcano. And I could be irritated, just a small volcano starting to happen. But it's not just a negative emotion. And now we're going to talk about negative and positive. When it comes to small children, and I would say K to 6, we don't really talk about negative emotion. We're afraid that children will think I'm bad. When I'm angry, I'm bad. We really want to avoid that. And now, in Buddhism, we can argue, because in Buddhist psychology, we do talk about destructive non-destructive emotion. But this is something you're going to have to discuss among ourselves. We talked a lot about that in Ladakh. It's, for me, I'm worried to say destructive emotion to a kindergarten student. I think it's too much. So for, for children, we talk about comfortable and uncomfortable emotions. This is more appropriate. And the other thing is small children go through emotion. They can't stop them. We all do. So it's not about avoiding them. This is something that we're going to live. Anger is part of life. And we can't avoid it, but we can manage it for sure. So comfortable, uncomfortable emotions. So volcano also has positive emotions, like excited. I'm so excited. My grandparents are coming over. I haven't seen them for a year. I can't listen today in my math class because I'm just waiting for class to be over. So this kid is in a volcano. But it's positive. It's not a negative or destructive. It's also quite comfortable. It's fun to be excited. So volcano is high dose energy. Now low energy. So same thing. This is, uh, can you name a feeling that would be in the iceberg? Sorry, I said volcano again. Can you name a feeling that would be in the iceberg? Hmm? Speak louder. 
Depression, I'm feeling depressed. That's a very, like, that would be the, this one is not working very well. Do you have another one? Thanks. Oh, there it is. Okay, depression, what else? Another feeling that we could have. Sadness, yes? Hopelessness, oh, that's a, that's a strong one. That, that's a deep, deep iceberg. Yeah, feeling hopelessness, powerless, uh, that leads to depression. So this whole family in the iceberg is, uh, so it's a very low energy and emotion, but it's, as we said yesterday with this brain, it's still very powerful. So in the brain, the same thing happens, whether you're excited or depressed, well, not the same, same, but for the sake of explaining it to, to uh, children, we say, look, these emotions are strong, so we need to get back to the calm alert zone, which is the tree. Has everybody had a look? Yeah, so the tree zone is when our brain is calm and alert. Means I'm grounded, but I'm focused. I can learn, I can memorize, I can play sports, I can do music. So this is calm and alert. So, and yesterday, as I said, we can be flipping our lid. I think I'm gonna try to show you the video. This is strong emotions, but we could be also a little bit, you know, in the volcano, a little bit in the iceberg, but still able to be uh, grounded and concentrated. So this is the emotional thermometer. Um, I'm gonna show you the Dan Siegel video now, I think, because it will make sense also. Uh, We'll give you a visual. So what we'll do is we'll watch uh, the video after when we get the sound back. Um, what I'm going to make you try this. As I say with children, we, you know, we, we don't know until we try it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our own emotional temperature. And to do that, you have to sit comfortably, feet on the ground. You're going to take three deep breaths. If you want, you can close your eyes. And then you're going to go see inside yourself how you're feeling right now. Are you in the volcano, iceberg, or calm alert zone? Ready? So I'll just wait for the galas. Okay, so let's do it. So we take three deep breaths. And now ask yourself, am I in the volcano, iceberg, or calm alert zone? Okay, did you find your temperature? So I'm doing with you right now exactly how I do it with my classes. Raise your hands if you're in the iceberg. Anybody in the iceberg? Oh, I see. Do you want to share why or no? I may not have, I may not have all the details accessible immediately as you ask them, but yes, and, and it's kind of a little bit curious because uh, it's not merely the iceberg that I am in. I'm also on the volcano side, and both of them are together. But not exactly deep enough. I'm on the boundary, so that's. So you're a little bit in the iceberg, and on the volcano. Okay, we're going to get to that because we could be in the th in the in the two. Who else wants to share? Who wants to share? Do you want to share? No, you don't want to share. Okay, raise your hand if you're a little bit in the iceberg, but still able to concentrate and focus. Okay, so you're a little bit there. Raise your hand if you're in the volcano. Oh, it's only the two of us? <laughs> I'm going to share why. The sound's not working, and I came in late, and I rushed through the market. I woke up at 11. I was up at 1. I'm in the volcano. So, um, yeah, I, I can't put a feeling on it yet, but it's really moving a lot inside of myself. The fun thing with this is children, for them, emotions are very physiological. They feel in their bodies first, before they can think and name. 
they feel it. So this one really is good. The guess in my school, okay, K6, guess who are the best at ta taking their temperature? Best students for taking the temperature. Hmm? How old do you think? It's my five-year-olds. Five-year-olds are very good with this. And when they understand, I will do something like, two boys come from recess, one hit the other, one is crying, the other one is really upset. What happened? We were playing outside, it was well, and then all of a sudden things went wrong. Wow, how are you feeling? If you took your temperature back then, what happened? Oh, we were both in the volcano. Okay, and then I hit him. Okay, yes, volcano does that. Strong emotion, poor strategies. Was that a good idea? No, not really. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, this is the kind of talk we will have with the children, going back to see where they were on their thermometer. Okay, so raise your hand if you're a little bit in the volcano. Okay, a little bit. And raise your hand if you're in a calm alert zone. Super focused. Who's in the calm alert? Yeah, I knew it. Yeah, it's impossible. Okay, we'll do it again. Raise your hand if you're in the iceberg. Okay, raise your hand if you're a little bit in the iceberg. Okay, volcanoes, raise your hand. Little bit in the volcano. And calm alert. Oh, I'm still, that means there are people nowhere on the thermometer. <laughs> I've got people missing from this. So I want you to practice this. From today, you're going to have to take your temperature often. Okay? And this is something we get good at. As the, you know, we, we start doing it, and then we get better at it. Uh, when I teach and things are difficult, while I'm teaching, often I'm taking my temperature because I'm, I'm having this you know, check on myself. Uh, when it comes to temperature, there's no right and wrong answers. Okay, yes, the, the two temperatures we were going to talk about. Yes, you can be in the iceberg and the volcano. You can be in both, okay? Uh, I'm super excited because my grandparents are coming, but I'm angry because I just had a fight with my best friend. And then, uh, so th that's a lot of emotions. Or I can be a little sick today, I'm not feeling that well. And I'm a little excited because the science class is coming up and I love science. Okay, so I can be a little bit there and I'm super focused. So we can be in the iceberg volcano and, but we can't be uh, iceberg volcano and calm alert. Like if your brain is like this, you can be calm alert, but you can be just here. So when we get the video going, Dan Siegel at the back, there's explanation, but Dan Siegel talks about Higher brain. Oh, there you go. Okay, we'll watch it. One of the most rewarding experiences for me has been to study brain science and apply it to the experience of parenting. And the hand model of the brain that I use to teach parents is very useful to understand that. So if you take your thumb and put it in the middle of your palm, put your fingers over the top, this is a very useful model of the brain. And when we can actually see in front of us what's going on in the brain, then we can change what the brain does. So let me walk you through very basically what happens in this brain and the structures in it. And it goes like this. The spinal cord comes up representing the wrist, and then you have coming up into the skull the brain stem and the limbic area which work together to help regulate arousal and your emotions and the way you have a fight, flight, freeze response. These are below the cortex, the limbic and brainstem areas, and the cortex is this higher part of the brain that allows us to perceive the outside world, to think and reason. And this frontmost part of the brain, right behind your forehead, so the person's oriented like this, is actually the part that regulates the subcortical limbic and brainstem areas. This regulation is very important because sometimes we can have all sorts of things happen in our life. We're tired, we're exhausted, someone pushes a particular emotional button, and we can flip our lids. So rather than being tuned in and connected and balanced and flexible, we can lose all of that flexibility, even lose moral reasoning, and act in ways that are terrifying to others, including our children. Now, you can actually bring yourself back online and come back to the high road and make a repair with your child, and that's important to explain to them, 
And you can also use this hand model of the brain to explain to children, even as young as five and six, how to understand when their emotions are rising up from the brainstem and limbic areas here, and how it's overriding the prefrontal area and making it so they may be about to flip their lids. So I've had kids come tell me that they're about to go flip their lids and they need a break. They need a timeout. And by even just naming that, they can tame it. And that's the power of using the hand model for ourselves and our children to help us all make sense of what goes on in the emotional communication that we have in the course of day-to-day -day life. Okay, any questions on, on the hand model of the brain? Dan Siegel was talking about the high road. This is a little confusing. Uh, I'm not a neuroscientist. I like to, things to be simple. We, he, in another video, if you, if you have YouTube, you can watch some of his things. It's very interesting. But he talks about the high brain and the low brain. Um, the neuroscientists will argue that this is not quite accurate. I'm coming from the point of view of teaching children uh, what is the easiest. And in front of a, you know, a bunch of five and six-year-olds, this really works, I can tell you. So the high brain is really um, actually the one that thinks, the one that, that is concentrated. It's the calm alert zone. And the low brain, which is lower, is the limbic system. So for us, this model works. The lower part of your thermometer would be the lower brain, where you're in emotions. The higher part is where you're in the thinking brain and you're in the calm alert zone. Okay, uh, any questions with that? No? Yes, I'll get closer. Uh, Ma'am, you, uh, you talk about the emotion thermometer and sometimes people experience both with the uh, volcanic part and icebergs together. Yes. So in that sense, uh, does it make that uh, if you have both together, that is cancel out each other, or it's it's make even more further destructive emotions. Um, emotions don't cancel out each other; they just like make more emotions. Uh, you can regulate emotions, but it's not like a positive and a negative, and then we're back to normal. That that doesn't work. So, but it's you know if you're going through a volcano and iceberg, of course you have a lot of uh, probably powerful emotions and when we don't pay attention to it it's all mixed up inside ourselves we don't really know what we're going what's what we're feeling but when you can this is just we're, we're talking about basic awareness emotional awareness yes I'm excited but I'm also really sad and now this makes sense um, his holiness talks about the map of mind and I know this is uh, well, Jinpa always argues with me that I don't fully understand it the same way he does, and I'm sure I don't because I, I, I'm not a Buddhist scholar. But m being able to develop this basic emotional awareness gives you an internal map of what's going on inside of you. So you need to know where you are on your thermometer, if you're in the volcano, if you're in the iceberg, and then it makes sense, and then you have more clarity, and then you can manage the emotions better. Okay, and the same for children. Um, I'll tell you, well, yeah, I'll tell you this story because it's quite nice. Little girl comes into the principal's office. She's brought by another teacher and she's screaming, she's angry. She looks very angry and she's really upset. She's giving, like, she's kicking on the table and the principal goes, okay, everybody out of my office. I'm just going to take care of her. So as an adult, we're looking at this going, okay, Angry kid, lack of respect, you know, we're very quick to judge. And so the, the principal says, well, she doesn't really know what to do. She says, calm down. And she, she shows the little girl the poster of feelings and needs. And the principal assumes she's in the volcano. Well, she looks like it. She is. But she thinks she's just angry and now she's lacking respect. The little girl looks at the feelings board and she says, I'm angry. Okay, we all knew that. And then she points to sad. Oh, why are you sad? And then she explains, well, I made a mistake. I was trying to do my homework, and I erased, and I made a hole in my sheet, and, and then I couldn't write again, and then I... So she, she's explaining that she was going through all these emotions that we assumed were just like anger and, and lack of respect, and actually it was something else. So she was also in the iceberg. 
And you won't know until the child explains to you. So making sense of what's going on is very important. And as the principal let the little girl talk, the little girl made sense of what's going on for her. I'm angry, I'm sad. What do I need? I need help. And I need to calm down. Okay, so now she's doing this on her own. And this is what we want. We want the children to become autonomous. I'm, I'm keep talking about children, but I really mean from you know K-12. So we want them to become autonomous in understanding what's going on inside and managing these emotions. Yes. So, Gala says that uh, volcano represents high emotions and the uh, icebox shows, you know, low emotions. Uh, not low, uh, low, low energy. Low energy, low energy. Okay. So, you said that both of them can come uh, simultaneously or at the same time. Is it possible? And if such things happen, then which will be more effective, I mean, for the person? Uh, uh, yeah. For regulating? Uh, regulating what? So which one will give the effect more? Or which one will have an effect? Yeah, yeah, that's yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, this depends on the situation. You know, if you have both volcano and iceberg, I don't know what happened to you. Is it because you fought and now the volcano is much stronger because I had a fight with my friend and I'm feeling sick? That's a little less, but it's still strong emotion. So it depends on the situation. So the emotion, you know, and the intensity depends on your situation and how you perceive. There, now there's the... the the thinking process will get into this. Uh, no, no, because they, they're there. The, the emotions happen, we feel them, and it's not like a positive and a negative equals zero. They, they stay here, okay? Okay, we'll get to that. Well, uh, it's, the, it's the anger. Well, depression can also lead to a lot of destruction. So this one is a low energy. Yes, so this is where I'm saying that in terms of Buddhist psychology, I'm going to show something a little different, but you can get back to the same place after. Low energy like depression, this is the probably the lowest, like depression, uh, sadness, um, feeling sick, um, nauseated, you know, so these emotions are low energy, but they're powerful. Okay. In the brain, if you put you in the scan, they will, the brain will light up at the same place pretty much. High energy, like the highest probably is anger, and we're talking about Destructive emotion, this is more like from the Buddhist point of view. Um, destructive emotion, the, the, probably the most destructive was, would be anger. Yeah. Disgust also. Yeah. Yes, everything that brings up aggression. Yeah. 
Is, is this okay? Okay, uh, one thing I need to add with this thermometer that you need to know, because this is the information, actually this, I, we teach this to starting age five, okay? Another thing we need to understand is the three Fs. I'm gonna write it on the board. Okay, so Dan Siegel mentioned very briefly the three Fs. Uh, can you see in the back? Is it okay? Can, can you see? Okay. Well, I'll speak and after, please come and take the note. So, three, the brain has three ways to protect itself. And again, I'm really sorry, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm saying very basic information. The reptilian brain, the very old part of our brain, the eldest part of our brain, was fully geared to protecting us. His thing, that bit was safety. Only thought about protecting us. So imagine millions, <laughs> or 10,000, 100,000 years ago, Earth was quite a dangerous place for human beings. There were all kinds of dangers and we could get killed easily or eaten by some big, you know, long saber, what do they call it, and the tigers with long teeth or crushed by a mammoth. So <laughs> our brain really was focused on survival. And we call those the three F's. So the first F is for freeze. So this is when our brain goes into freeze mode. And who was it? We had a little talk about that yesterday. Okay, freeze mode. And this is how I teach it to, to, to children. I pretend I'm a prehistorical woman about to go eat berries. And then I see a mammoth and my brain goes, <gasps> Don't move, there's an elephant coming, okay? So raise your hand if this has ever happened to you, not bump into a mammoth, but <laughs> have you ever been so scared or startled that you just froze like this? Raise your hand if this happened to you. Yeah, you put your foot in the street, a car's coming. <laughs> yes, yeah. I wanna see everybody's hands up because all, yeah, everybody raise your hand because this happens to everyone, yeah. I don't want to see everybody hands up. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, this still works today. It's valid in 2018. Our brain still works like this. And it's very useful because it protects us. But sometimes it doesn't because there are no more mammoths in the schoolyard. And sometimes my teacher gives me a math test and my brain freezes. It still works like this. So we need to counter it and tell it, okay, here I don't need to freeze, I'm safe. And sometimes we need to use it. In the street, I have to be careful. Okay, first F. Second one is flight. So if I'm a prehistorical lady and I'm going to eat my berries and I see this tiger coming, I'm gonna run for my life. Okay, this is flight. So raise your hand if you were ever startled or scared and you just woo, went for it. Yeah, everybody's hands up. Yes, thank you, because your brain still works like that. Okay. <laughs> so we still have these two Fs in our brains. And the last one, let me write it down, is the F for fight. So back then, the berries were very rare. So if I'm a prehistorical lady going for berries and there's another lady coming, I'm gonna go, no, those are my berries, go away. And I'm gonna fight for it, okay? So raise your hand if you've ever been angry and you just went like, oh, or I wanna see everybody's hands up. <laughs> okay, because the fight mode, you may not hit someone, but you may have been, doing this, oh, I hate this thing. Our body tenses up. This is the fight, I'm getting ready to ooh, do something about this, okay? So in 2018, this part of our brain is still there and it affects us. If we're conscious, if we're aware, we can counter it. But for children in the schoolyards, this happens a lot. And then they come back to your classes and when you're in a, one of the Fs, where is your brain, you think? Is it like this or like this? Yeah, it's really like this. So these students are not ready to learn. 
So we need to help them regulate and get back to Calm Alert. Okay? So now I think we've gone around the brain part. Any questions on the brain and the thermometer? Yes? Uh, it's, it's more about a uh, contribution, that I, a, sm a small input that I'd like to make. Uh, you just mentioned that the, hind brain, the older brain, uh, the older brain uh, is more a uh, seed for negative emotions, um, including the limbic system. Um, I'd possibly want to add that even certain positive emotions, some very basic calm states, do have their seat in the same limbic system, but different circuitry. Uh, the amygdaloid, okay, okay, no technicalities. There are certain uh, group of cells which control fear. The freeze one which you were mentioning has to do with amygdala. It's, uh, it stores those memories and anything similar to that and the person reacts the same way. So that's one, but there are also positive emotions in the same limbic system, which is the early brain. What the recent one does, what the cortical areas do, is they allow it to work in it, they regulate it to work in a particular way and not the other. And when we're healthy, uh, we have a certain way of even the cortical system working so that those parts which are associated with healthy, calm states work more often, rather most of the day. So 24 hours, say 16, 17 hours of healthy, happy state maybe one or two hours here and there. Uh, those also not in continuation, but split states where it shifts to the negative side, but quickly reverts back to the positive. That's the healthy state. So you're, you're asking what, what happens when we, we shift from one to the other? I was, uh, I, was just, uh, I was just trying to point out that the same negative uh, brain also has portions which would actually contribute to happiness and calmness. It's just that the circuitry is different, but they're seated at the same spot if you were to look at it. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so you must know more about me uh, in the neuroscience bit. To, to, but to, to get back to your point, which is very important, for me, once I've known this, this is information, this is the basic neuroscience we give to students, okay? This is very basic. Once we've gone through that, after that, for me, the emotional realm is very rich and important. And of course, we try to, you know, cultivate the positive emotions, but we never ever stop the negative from coming because they're part of life. But we have to be aware, recognize, and regulate. So we always tell the students emotions are welcome and we need to tame them. But then sometimes if you're in the volcano or in the iceberg, your strong emotion gives you bad strategies. I'm angry, I hit. Anger is not really the problem here. It's the fact that I have a strategy for it. This hitting is wrong, not anger. I have to deal with my anger. Um, I'm sad and I told my friend, I don't like you anymore. You're not my friend, you're really not nice bad strategy so the sadness if i'm aware i step back wow i'm so sad instead of going into poor strategy and saying i don't like you i'm gonna this is the next step where we're going we're gonna see what i need i need friendship and i need to understand why we had a fight and then i can say do you want to talk about it and then it's easier and i don't have a poor strategy now i'm making a better choice so, so it's, yes, we've gone through the negative emotion, we've gone through the three Fs, but now moving on, this is a very rich field. This is all about our emotions. It's about bringing awareness to them, recognizing, detangling, when they all come together and they're all mixed up, so I can have a clearer map of myself inside, and I don't let my emotion make me do bad strategies, like hitting, being negative, saying bad things, okay? Um, His Holiness always says to achieve peace, you need inner peace. Now this is step number one to inner peace. Because you won't get inner peace unless you know what's going on inside yourself. Okay, so inner peace. Okay, um, yes, questions? Right? 
uh, three poisons, uh, ignorance, attachment, and aversion. And attachment, I have checked all of the three, and the volcano I just connected with uh, the uh, aversion maybe, right? Aversion. Uh, aversion. And iceberg, iceberg, we can relate with the, the ignorance, which is quite passive, right? Uh, uh, compared with the volcano. Uh, volcano so with the, yeah. Which one? Which one is the volcano? Uh, adversion. Okay. Uh, active. Yeah. Very, right? And the iceberg, we can relate with the uh, ignorance, okay. which looks calm, but uh, it's again an active emotion. Where we should place the attachment according to the same. Well, I, I love the fact that you're trying to uh, find a place for the three poisons. I would be cautious not to put them anywhere because emotions are not fixed. You know, ignorance could come by being, you know, like if you think about sadness, I could be ignorant because I, I think you're, you don't like me anymore, you're not my friend, but actually we are. This could be some form of ignorance. I didn't understand what was going on. These three poisons could happen, I think, everywhere. Now, this is where, with the Genlas, we can have some good discussions about how the poison are connected to emotion in, in, Buddhist, in Tibetan Buddhist psychology. But I would be cautious to, you cannot just put things. Hmm? Yes. Yes. But I, I would say that ignorance could be uh, attached to anger or sadness. Um, aversion could make me angry, and aversion could make me uh, surprised. So I, this we would need to discuss because it's an interesting point. But for the thermometer, there's, I, I would say be careful not to think there's a category. The, the, ex, the point of the thermometer is just to have some basic awareness of what's going on inside without judgment. And that's the important bit. We're not judging the emotion. We're not classifying it. We're observing it. We're shining a light on what's going on. Okay? And then we can name and we can connect to need. And then we can find a strategy to counter it. Um, but let, let's keep this in mind as we do the work this week. Maybe the three poison will come up. We, we talked about that in Ladakh, but we didn't, uh, we didn't bring it actually in connection with the thermometer. So let's just keep this in mind. This is fun because we'll, we'll see where, it, maybe we'll find, oh my goodness, it fits with this. So for now, let's just leave it there. Okay, any other questions? Oh yes, one more question. Uh, 3F. 3F, the, um, Evolution genico lerial and Persian Queen with Rukuda, Panjuruko and Alaku Panjur geni leris. A need then a garong a coach in a ten neuroscience no longer as the genotype and phenotype that some jurdic. Think among a man Pages and Nazu Zurta and the Nimangima meet you to Zurta Yomare. Surta, Pana Nala gene de and Jura Lidero. Jura take the tongue of Panjur Nala that you meet Zurta Sawati Leungdua. A need then the emotion in Zu. ตะมันจิงนี้มาดิโซละเชนาตานี่เทรนด์ด้วยอ่ะตานี่ทําจริงจิติยูเดยอดิชิกะติตะตันเดชิกันติตันตันกันซูยอรอตันดิกรอนจ
living around. Uh, that's another. Gela Hindi, chalega. I need a translator. No, no. Okay, then uh, we'll keep it. To, we'll keep it. To, we'll keep. It. See, the the part with genes is that um, they do change with generations, but their basic structure doesn't change. It's the composition inside. The gene is like a cord, you know, right? like a hair, long, lengthy hair. And parts of it you call gene. Part, distinct parts in that hair is what you call gene. And all of that is packed into a chromosome. So across generations, uh, certain parts of that hair keep changing. So father had one kind of a gene, uh, a rather chromosome with so many genes, about 25,000 of them that have been identified. Sun will also have 25,000, but different colors, if I could say like that. Okay, different in nature, but still 25,000, still the basic structure. Uh, an example of it could be that we all carry pen, and it keeps evolving, but then still at the end of it, you know, it's a pen. The same basic functioning units inside it. So the same thing about the gene, that you have a lengthy cord. Cord would be like dhaga. Can, can you tell them? thread, very fine thread with specific identifiable segments. And each of these segments are called genes. Okay, All of them constitute together, they constitute what is called the chromosome. And the chromosome keeps changing the genes inside of it, but the chromosome is retained. So the genes are there. They're just getting mixed and matched. They're still there. Uh, and once we have an identifiable species, so we are humans, and then there is a chimpanzee, and we're just 1% away from that, that chromosomal structure. Just 1%, 99% same. But we're so different. What he's saying is whether in nine generations these uh, three Fs should have gone away. No. That is evolutional, and those genes we all carry. They, they, they are there because we are human. They'll not go away like that. And also, if I may add, um, I will wait. The, the three Fs are there for protection. So at the basis, this is survival protection. They're still very useful to us. Because if I don't get hit by a car because my brain just picked it up and I, stole, I stopped, we don't want to lose this. And so these are, they still have a function in our lives. But we should not be overwhelmed and be prisoners by them. So when we understand, that when, when we have a good map of mind, when we understand what's going on, then we can control. So the idea is not to say destructive emotion should not be there, because it will be there. The idea is to master it so it does not affect me. So I don't know if this gets close to Buddhist psychology. Uh, but Anger, we have to know what it is. We need to observe it, see it's making me do a bad strategy, and then manage all of this so I don't engage in it. And it is a destructive emotion. The scientists now know that if you look at the cell, people who have a lot of anger, or probably even down to depression, yes, actually, depression also, the, the, the tip of our cells, the telomeres, I think, gets eroded. So structurally speaking, these affect our physiology. They're very strong, and it's true, it's destructive. But if I'm trying to ignore it and say, no, 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 it's not going to work. I need to understand how to work with it and control it. And let, not let these destructive emotions affect me in my life. Uh, can I say just a few things? Um, it doesn't mean that the genes that we have in human is totally different from that is present in other animals. There are a lot of things which are common. So maybe the genes that are responsible for this F, 3F, they are common for most of the organisms that we have the same, you know, um, sensation, five, freeze, flight, fight. And this is a very important, for not only for just human beings, the things that, uh, I mean, the important things that we have is we have a higher brain thinking. That is why we can control it to some extent, right? Maybe not, but as compared to the other organisms, other animals. So um, 
it's it's not that uh, totally we are different. The genes are totally different from uh, other organisms. And so I said that chimpanzees and there are many baboons. There are many organisms, uh, you know, mammals, which we have a very close, you know, right. And I also feel that um, throughout the evolution, we also have a lot of changes in our gene sequence, DNA, and lot of lot of changes are there. But it doesn't mean that it totally changes after a few generations. It is a very long process. And that's why it is an evolution, not a revolution. Actually, this would be a great question for His Holiness. Uh, maybe when I'm in Dharamsala, I ask him. <laughs> so, okay, so we've, we've seen the brain. Oh, yeah? Uh, it's, it's just about uh, one of the things that was quoted. Uh, see, sometimes philosophy, as it is rooted in the traditional uh, thought system, and uh, these, uh, these bits of information and knowledge that you're bringing through your workshop, they seem to have common terms. Uh, but the meaning is quite different. Like, uh, just now, uh, there was a mention about those, uh, I'm not very familiar, but there was a mention about three poisons. And one of them is attachment. Unfortunately, for, for if you look at the same uh, word attachment from the perspective that you are presenting, it's not a poison. It's actually a very big uh, driver for the person throughout the life. So you have to caution that. There are two different terms. Okay, so another really nice, important point, and this has to do with cultural translation. <laughs> so the three poisons but, uh, we, we, that we mentioned, and I said just leave them there for now because they will come back probably during our week. Um, the theory of attachment in psychology is extremely uh, important in terms of human development. And uh, again, I'm no expert. You probably know more than I do. But human beings, and even His Holiness will say, and you've heard him, you know, saying that his greatest teacher was his mother because she showed him compassion and then she held him and she fed him. So when the babies are born and a human being picks them up, the first contact with the skin lights up the brain. And the brain activates. This is the first uh, way our brain starts developing, physical touch, and then the look in the eyes. And, and this is fascinating. Um, there's a scientist that was in Serra in 2015 at Mind and Life. She studies babies 0 to 20 minutes years old. <laughs> really, literally. She's you know, waiting for the mom. The baby comes, she takes the baby with the parents' permission. And you know what they do with the baby? They look at the baby and they go like this. And then the baby, zero, one minute year old, goes. And then the first time they say, wow, this is crazy, let's do it again. It was just like luck. And then the baby goes, two minutes old. Completely able to mime the face. This doesn't last very long, but it shows that already there's something about the brain. We pick the baby up, contact, lights up, completely focused on a face and mimics what's going on. So we human beings get attached. We need attachment to develop and not attachment in, sense, in the sense the negative one uh, in Buddhism, the one that is destructive. Attachment in terms of human uh, connection. So instead of attachment, maybe we should say human connection. So, and there, we, we could go on to this because it's absolutely fascinating. There are many types of attachment, secure, insecure, uh, disorganized, I think. So depending on the type of attachment small baby has with the family, the parent, or the, the primary person who gives care, some form of attachment will develop. If the baby is neglected, if there's no physical touch, the human beings get very sick. Uh, we, we don't thrive, we don't develop. So uh, even a small infant, there's a lot of studies done on orphans in different parts of the world that are just put in a bed and left there and then we just feed them. But these, these babies don't thrive and, and the brain shuts down and at a physiological level, you know the neurons, they connect and they send electricity. Because the baby does not receive touch and care and warmth and compassion, the cell covers themselves with a, some kind of amino acids, I don't know, and, and then the signals don't get into 
it just stops and disconnects and it, it's terrible and these babies just start making connection and they go i don't know what happens really in the brain but they go inwards and then they don't engage with others so this is one extreme form showing how this human connection is fundamental this goes uh, this is extremely relevant i'm glad we're talking about that it's it's super relevant to teaching and your uh and your career because we always say relationships are important when you teach and good teaching happens when you have good relationships with your students it's a form of attachment it's a form of you you at a, a, a higher level these are not babies you're not holding them in your arms although it's fun to cuddle kindergartners but you're also forming an attachment and a bond and a relationship with them and depending on how you can have a relationship with your students this will determine the type of teaching and learning that will take place and it's all about this uh, social emotional realm it's all about cell so we've gone into the three f's a little bit of theory of attachment <laughs> um, and the relationship and as very important so don't forget human beings in terms of attachment we we need the human connection to thrive and this is true in your class uh, this is true when you're teaching teenagers or looking at you like this they probably need more connection than others uh, kids who go have tantrum difficulty controlling their anger they need attachment and i would say actually adopt your toughest behaviors the kids with the worst behavior, these are the ones that you need to have the best relationship with. And if you can manage that, you will have success. But if you take it personal, that this kid is just lazy and is annoying or she's lacking respect, well, you're not gonna achieve anything. So we have to understand that these children probably have problems elsewhere, maybe with their attachment. And we're in charge as adults and as teachers to create a relationship. I'm not saying become best friends. This is not at all what I'm saying. You're professionals, you're teachers, but you're caring and you need to come with compassion. And uh, you also have to be firm sometimes because you're gonna need boundaries. But it is a type of attachment. So this is also key uh, in, in teaching and education. Okay, tea time, oh, perfect. Okay, so let's have tea. <laughs> Okay, um, during the break, we had a really nice conversation. I just want to mention uh, quickly. So we're, we're not going into Buddhist philosophy with this uh, or Buddhist psychology because we're going to go too far. I want you to think in terms of keep, keeping this very basic. If you want to go into uh, Buddhist psychology, come and talk to me after. And <laughs> I've had some wonderful talks in Ladakh uh, with the Geshe who teaches in a school. But for now, I want you to remember that this is simple. We're using this for ourselves, but also to teach children. And in this sense, this is a tricycle. This is not a high-speed race car we're giving them. You don't want to go too far into trying to think, this. I'm going to go into uh, what we were talking about, analytical... Uh, meditation or trying to don't, don't go too far keep it very simple for now because when it comes to your students it has to be simple we don't want to to cause trouble by going too far okay so it's a tricycle this thermometer is basic emotional awareness it means just being able to see is something happening inside of me and is it in the volcano or iceberg is it hot or cold and can I be focused? This is the tool. This is just very simple. Okay. Um, we were also talking about the fact that cell, when we start developing self-awareness and regulation, it's a prevention factor against mental illness also. So children who have these tools and this practice, first of all, when I teach children and I see that they can't do this, already, they, they, see, also think this is not a curriculum this is not an academic topic when it comes to cell there's no right and wrong answer please take this out of your mind right away if you're upset that your children or your students can't take their temperature you can't be in the volcano you're smiling how come you're angry 
we don't know. That's their thing. Okay, there's no right and wrong answer. I also, I often have kids like, yeah, I'm in a volcano. I'm so angry today. But they're, they're happy to share and they're so happy to share this emotion. So there's no wrong answer ever because it belongs to the person and it's their own emotion and, and you don't know what, you can't go inside of them. So never a wrong answer, but things tell you things. So a kid that says, oh, I'm in the iceberg because I need to play. You go, oh, wow, okay, that's interesting. You gotta be curious with that kid to see what's going on. Can they really connect the feelings and the need? Well, so they, they're giving you clues. You're not saying you can't be you know, sad and want, uh, don't do that. It's their answer, it belongs to the person, but be curious. And I'm gonna give you my first teacher mantra. I'm sorry, I'm using mantras for teachers. Um, remain curious instead of furious. So write this down and I want this to stay in your head and very clearly remain. So be curious instead of furious. When we teach Sal, funny things happen and curiosity will get you out of any situation. But f anger and f being furious will disconnect you from what you're trying to achieve and, and the relationship. It will cut the relationship. Okay, so this is uh, mantra number one. Um, before we continue, I'm going to show you a, a film. Now we're going to talk, we've talked about the awareness, we're going to see about regulation. I'm aware of my feelings and needs, what, what, what's happening inside? And then how do I manage this? What do I do with this after? How do I get my brain back to here? And this we can achieve by doing exercises. Uh, meditation is one of them. And again, uh, another super uh, important point that we had during tea break, when it comes to, we, we're saying we're gonna meditate with children and, and students. We don't meditate the way, uh, like, you know, a monastics or a high level meditator adult will meditate. This is too advanced. We never give these meditation to children. For children and students, we talk about basic regulation, breathing meditation, and even a little further mindfulness. Full stop. That's it. It is dangerous to take teenagers and engage them in analytical meditation. Their brain is not there. We don't know what kind of experiences is going on in their lives. The last thing you want is to trigger extremely painful, difficult emotions for them that you won't be able to manage. You don't know all your students. Well, you know them, but you don't know where they come from. Some of them may have a mental illness, and this will trigger it. Some of them may be traumatized, and that's another set of problem. If you start going into difficult emotions, they will get triggered and you won't be able to help. So we don't go into in-depth analytical or any type of, uh, the, well, very advanced meditation. We're using the word meditation in terms of regulation. Breathing techniques, mindfulness if you want. Observe your thinking, let your thoughts out. Breathe in, thoughts out, that's it. So, yes? Just very quickly, I want to add one thing. Uh, in certain conditions which are uh, related with mental health, meditation is known to worsen it. Known to worsen it. Yes. I mean, it triggers real worsening spells. Uh, and these are, uh, unfortunately, the conditions which don't reverse easily to health. So thank you for pointing out. No, uh, no I'm, I'm super super, super sensitive to mental health. I know in India, maybe we talk less about it than we do in Canada. Uh, so, and when Tara comes next week, she can also give you a lot of uh, information. But you need to be aware that when you see something and you know something is wrong, we, you never force students. This, this is why, you know, I said before, never right or wrong when it comes to sell, and you never force students. A student says, I don't want to meditate. You says, great, sit down, but just take some deep breath. Put your head on your, on your desk 
and we never go into very long exercises. So whenever something happens that you're not planning, like a student saying no or this or that, this is information itself. So it's telling you something, it's super important. So you pay attention, but you don't force, you never ever force anything. Okay, in Canada, just to give you a number in Canada, and I'm sure India is, I don't know, I'm not a scientist, but I would agree that we're pretty much in the same place. In Canada, one out of five children has a mental illness. And so that's a lot. Imagine your class, you have 30 students. How many are, th you know, that's already <laughs> quite a lot. And out of these one child per five, only 25% in Canada get the help they need by a professional. So I don't know what it is like in India, but there's no point pretending it's not happening. Uh, so same here, you have some children, and mental illness is, is I'm saying mental illness, there's all kinds, it's a spectrum. So first of all, we talk about mental well-being, mental hygiene. The same way we take care of our physical body. We're eating well, we do sports, my body's healthy. Same with our mind. So if I don't take care of my mind, and we don't teach this, this is what CELL does in school. This is why it's a prevention factor, because now you're giving children tools to start paying attention to their mind and their hearts. So that will act as a prevention factor. So as you develop these methods, it's very important you know, that you keep an eye on children. You don't force because the kids who are not doing the exercises, they're the ones who need help probably. Now if you force them to do well and achieve like an <laughs> academic topic, you know, the right answer, you're missing this. You want things to not go well so that you really know what's going on with your children. That's, that's the trick. So, and um, we'll talk about how to support children with special needs. So, but if we have a good mental hygiene, we can prevent mental illness. Okay, mental illness, a lot of them develop. So you have some neurological issues. Now this is something with your brain. It's different, it's not a mental illness. This is, my brain is different and it doesn't process information like yours. That's one thing. But then children going through difficult situation, who have poor emotional hygiene because they don't get it from around themselves, well, they're at risk of developing a mental illness. And we can prevent that and we can help. But you will do this by having a good relationship with them and being able to put your cell glasses and understand where they need help. Okay, is that good? Right, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Then the kids are in ditch danger. And the poor good the that I was Jago to let you. Poor honor Jago, the book around the buns and then on the carriage and the pain to Jago to let you. Then you try to see a Ruda Canada and all that to see the poor Lobjon Matungi. ま、僕自身のパラチャンにいろいろ。だ、パラチャンで、かつ、ルーティンのような形で読んでいる。ちょっと、え、しやだ、ね、ぶさです。だから、あの、ジェネラルの部分に参加いるね。パーティー部分に
this material sell emotional literacy, you should not force. Math, yes, that's different. Math, physics, science, yes, go for it. Yeah, I'm not saying leave the children free. I'm, I'm saying when you develop emotional literacy, you don't force. Okay, because you become an observer of where your students are and what skills they have. And now you're going to help them develop them. Okay, so is that clearer? Yeah. Yeah, I'll translate, I'll start this. So is it clearer? Okay, so it's not, this is not about uh, just letting the children do whatever they want. But when it comes to learning this, you, you don't force. Because it has to do with the personal realm, emotion, and that is personal, and I can't force that. But I can make you understand math, <laughs> and I can teach you uh, all kinds of topics. But when it comes to this, this belongs to the individual. And but having said that, yes, because we're, we're going into a diff uh, really nice topic. Oh my goodness, that, that will depend. Uh, that depends very much from the region where you are. Uh, where I am in Quebec, there's a quite a high rate of dropout, especially for boys. Um, the rate, the exact rate, 10, 15%, I think, and that's enormous. Um, in the States, it varies by state, where you are in the States. In Canada, it's different from Quebec, from Ontario. So I can't give you a real rate. But uh, dropout is a problem. Uh, success rate is quite high, but we still have dropout. So. Uh, okay, so I'm going to show you, uh, this is my school where I work, and you're going to see my friend Tara, she's the, the one with blonde hair. Sadly, I'm not on this video because when they filmed it, I was sick. Uh, <laughs> so uh, what we've done, this is what I show teachers actually in Quebec. This is how we train them and we show them how we teach this in the schools. We've, again, separated self-awareness from management, so to show clearly what the two are. But they, all, they always come together, you know. In a class, take three, in breath, temperature, feeling needs, and then... So we, we do it together, but here in this video, they're separated so you see it more clearly. Oh, it's in French, you have to read. Cet après-midi, c'est notre période zone de paix. OK? Alors, on va commencer par aller voir ce qui se passe à l'intérieur. On va prendre trois respirations, puis on va aller voir qu'est-ce qui se passe en dedans. Est-ce que ça bouge? Est-ce que c'est chaud? Est-ce que c'est froid? Est-ce que c'est tendu? Peut-être que pour toi, c'est plus facile si tu fermes les yeux. Mais tu n'es pas obligé de fermer les yeux. Est-ce que tu es prêt? OK. Alors, tu peux mettre tes mains sur ton bonhomme parce que l'air doit aller jusqu'au fond. On y va. Tu as trouvé ce qui se passe? OK. On ferme les yeux. Trois grandes respirations. Première respiration. Et on prend notre température. On se pose la question. Comment je me sens aujourd'hui? Volcan, banquise. Lève la main si tu es dans le volcan. Okay. Qui est dans le banquise aujourd'hui? Qui est vraiment dans la zone calme, alerte? Ça va très bien aujourd'hui. Pour toi, Madeleine? Je suis dans la banquise parce que je me sens un peu comme un Je suis dans la zone calme, alerte parce que, parce que je suis très bien écoutée. She's our pro. She's 
Est-ce qu'il y a deux amis, qui, deux, deux amis qui veulent partager leurs sentiments et leurs besoins aujourd'hui? C'est dans deux. Nathan. Est-ce que tu n'as pas peur? Quand on a peur de quelque chose de nouveau, tu as besoin de quoi? Je pense que oui. So now self-management, regulation. Actually, this is regulation. Okay. Alors, on va montrer un petit changement d'énergie. Comment on peut retourner au calme avant de faire notre activité? On est prêt? Okay. Alors, pied par terre, dos droit, on inspire, on frotte les mains, on va prendre cinq grandes respirations. On inspire avec le nez. On expire avec la bouche. On y va. Un. On ça entre nous. On inspire. On ferme les yeux. This is Ladakh. So, as you can see, we're, we're using the same material in Ladakh. And uh, some basic calming meditation exercise. So, um, You'll be happy to know that we've designed a poster for Tibetan communities with Tibetan children's faces. It's really cute. It's super, I, I love it. My kids saw them and said, oh, we want some for our room. I don't have them with me now because I, we've just finished the feeling side. But starting uh, this summer, I will have some real Tibetan children so it's easier for them to relate. Uh, universality of the method. When I teach this at school, it doesn't take long, the kids get it right away. The, say, think in your school population, K-12, which students are the most emotionally literate, you think? I want to hear you. Who do you think is most emotionally literate from K to, 12 years, uh, K to 12 grades? Who are the best students with emotional literacy? Or who are the best people in your schools? The younger children, you know, they they are better. Uh, maybe five, six. Absolutely, I I would say uh, K four. So from uh, and even the three and four year old for basic, it's a little harder. Something happens with a five year old; they, they just get it. And so all the way up to grade four, they're super emotionally literate. They're much better than you. Who are the worst? the least emotionally literate people in your schools? Yes, well, <laughs> sadly, sorry, it's us. Okay, so we I, I really need to, for you to, to get this. Your students are probably better than you, but they've never been given the tools, so you don't know. 
But the minute you give them these, watch out, because they're so good, and they're going to you know, they're going <laughs> to tell you their feelings and needs and they're going to expect the same kind of thing from you. So you need to develop your emotional literacy or else you won't be able to keep up with them. And I'm not a scientist again, but I'm wondering, is, you know, when the brain develops, children are more in their Im limbic system. This is not finished yet. When do you think the, the, the frontal cortex finishes developing? How old do you think we are when it's done? I know you do. <laughs> yeah, no, don't say anything. <laughs> so give me an age. When do you think we're finished, you know, developing our brain? 18? Okay, who else? Take, uh, there's no right and wrong answer. This is where you start practicing with me. Give me some ages. Hmm? F what did you say? Hmm? Oh, the question is, at what age does the human brain finish developing? Although we know there's plasticity, so it goes on all our life, but the, the, the brain, when you say, okay, this brain is finished developing, what age? Hmm? Which one? Puberty, give me an age. 18, 16? Okay, so we have 18, 16, what else? Hmm? 10, 10, 13, okay. Raise your hand if you're 24. Raise your hand if you're 24. You, no, 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 but raise your hand. Is anybody 24? Anybody 25? Are you below the, those ages? Who's below 24? Raise your hand. You below 24? What's your age? Kiran, look at Sore. Twenty two? Any? Twenty seven. Oh, you're above. Okay. You? Okay, so the brain now the science is saying is finishes developing at twenty four. And they're stretching it to twenty eight. In the community they're not sure yet. We're we're there, right? So your brain is still not fully finished yet. So it takes a long time. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to jump straight. Is there any questions now about the film? What exactly is emotional literacy? Okay, good question because this is what we're doing today. Emotional literacy uh is the ability to name your feelings accurately not just how are you feeling today oh, good bad that's not very literate name your feelings understand their impact on your behavior I'm angry and I hit someone not good yes my anger made me hit understanding the connection it's not other people's fault it's me um, and then I would add with literacy regulating also Understanding that, you know, when I have strong emotion, I'm in charge of regulating them. This is emotional literacy, okay? So it's a set of many things. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a process of learning. So emotional literacy happens the same way you learn to read and write. So you can't really say, my first graders don't really know how to read. I think it's going to be too hard for them. You're going to have to work hard when they're small. And slowly, you still read all your life, all throughout your education. Emotional literacy will be developed throughout education also, the same way. So a kindergartner's, yes, they really have a hard time regulating. And this is where we adults play a more important role in helping them by staying regulated myself. When I see something happening, if I come like this and I'm dysregulated, all these little brains are like, Ooh, and we're all like this. But if I see something happening and I come calm and I say, okay, what's going on? And I take care of myself, I help them regulate. Yes. So I think there's some, uh, like, uh, poor they have a high emotional literacy, but poor regulation. Okay, because the brain is mostly here. But you develop 
slowly you need so when they're small well what I mean is that children will uh, know their feelings and needs better than you do or me okay so in that sense emotional literacy the way I use it is quite broad for me it's the whole thing it's being able to name and regulate and understand the impact when you're with small children they're very good at doing feelings and needs um, actually why don't we do this again I, I have if somebody could help me there's 25 so try to share maybe uh, by two there's a poster of needs and a poster of feelings so small children get this really quickly now the regulation part is more difficult because their brain is not mature in that sense yet but they're more in the sense of literate in, ter in terms of feelings and needs they're more than we adults often are okay the regulation part will happen later as the brain matures but for some reason small kids really get feelings and needs okay so that's why you will need to develop this literacy yourselves so before we go too far and we, we've spoken a lot about feelings now I'm going to talk about needs a little bit because I've been telling, telling you about needs. Ne this, yes, question? <laughs> okay. I, I think I'm going to just say something. There, there are things which you are telling us and they're counterintuitive. They don't stand to reason. And that's why the question. But, but uh, like you, uh, you just, uh, we had a question that children should not be aware of their feelings at that age as aware of their feelings as easily as when they grow up a little so that uh, all this exercise if this were done at adolescence or later would be more helpful that that was the question if i'm right so the reason behind it is that it appears to the mind as counterintuitive when we hear it but that it happens developmentally like that even though it is counterintuitive that is what needs to be i'm not sure if, if that can be uh, i don't know what about counterintuitive but this I'm speaking from my experience in the field and I think that we human beings are born uh, this is what the latest science is showing we're, we're geared toward compassion and kindness and we're very literate in our emotions but our systems don't train it we lose it because we don't pay attention in our schools and his holiness always said did you read the article uh, this the paper I gave you yesterday so he says, his holiness says, you know, all, everybody gets educated, but there are still terrible things happening in the world. That means we're not doing something in our schools. We're not doing this in our school. I see amazing kids in kindergarten. Under, the minute that we explain this to them, they get it. And then they get home and then tell their parents off. Hey, look at you. Tell me your feelings I need. Mommy, I think you need to calm down. I'll show you how to do it. Okay, and then parents call us back the next day saying my kindergartner explained that to me can you also tell me what you're doing okay so the kids get it we don't train it so we lose it okay so because uh, of course as we mature we, we should be more literate but starting grade four in all the schools that I've been this human natural quality goes down and we lose it because we don't talk about this because we don't consider it useful or it's not part of our school systems so okay let me tell you about needs so feelings and needs these two together that comes from something called nonviolent communication and this was uh, I spoke about it briefly yesterday this was uh, discovered by Marshall Rosenberg so he realized that when we have when we can name our feeling but we connect it to a need something really magical happens because we get a full understanding of that emotion and needs are human values okay they're not things or they're not wants things that I want yes I need some uh, maybe I, I need some chocolate because I like sweets this is a want I want something but needs so this is how we teach uh, children ask yourself the question 
Do all human beings need chocolate? No. But do, you, do, do all human beings need to eat? Yes, this is a survival need. So the needs also are, were organized by another scientist in a, in a pyramid. And at the basis, the Maslow pyramid, the survival needs. So do all human beings need shelter? Yes, a house, clothes, protection. Do all human beings need safety? Yes. Do all human beings need friendship? Yes, so all these needs you have on this poster are actually, most of them, core human values that all human beings have. So it goes like this. This emotional literacy goes in terms, we have emotions that are positive when our needs are met. I'm feeling happy because I'm meeting all kinds of new people and this is exciting for me. That meets my need for friendship. So this is more positive. More negative emotion when our needs are not met. I'm feeling angry because I need respect. And when we were playing before, I, I felt there was no respect because my friend took my ball away without asking. So this need is unmet. So now I feel a sense of threat or it brings up emotions. So needs, when they're met, positive emotion, happy, joyful. When they're not met or we're, when we have a sense that my need is not met, it's negative. Angry, sad, frustrated, upset. Um, how to use this poster? This is really important. Uh, could you yeah, hold them? <laughs> So you go like this, I feel, and you point to the feeling. You don't say, I feel that you, or you add something, because this is called speak, making an I statement. Have you heard that? It's like speaking from my point of view. So never add anything. I feel, bang, surprised. I feel angry. I feel happy. I don't say, I feel that you, because then that means I'm talking to you. This is here. I'm talking about me. Same thing with needs. I feel surprised. I need to understand myself. Not, I feel surprised. I need to understand you. There's no you in this. Never, ever. If you put a you, you're not using it the right way. Um, I've seen teachers say, I feel angry because you are not doing what I'm asking you, so I want you to respect me. Is that good? No. I'm like, ah, okay. <laughs> we want, as teachers, you're gonna have to use this as an I statement. And why is that? Because when we make I statements, we're not threatening someone. You know, thank you, you can put them down. So I feel, I feel angry and I want you to respect me. How do you feel when I say that? Yeah, your brain goes, you shut down. It's like, oh, my fault, I'm not gonna do it. But if I say, I'm feeling really angry right now and I need respect because there's so much noise in the class, I can't do anything. So how does that feel? Is that feeling more comfortable? Yes, because I didn't accuse you. I just spoke about what's going on for me. And now, that, that is your second mantra for today. That's called connect before correct. Okay, so when you make I statement, you keep the connection in the relationship with your students. You're not disconnecting. And then you can attend, correct, or do some intervention if you have to. Okay, so connect before correct. If you disconnect, if you lose a relationship, probably your students are like this inside. They're not gonna want to engage and you're not gonna achieve much, all right? So this is really important. So those are I statements and we teach children to use them in the same way. And it's, at the beginning, it's a little hard. You know, I, 
I'm uh, angry and I need you to play with me, what I would say is, oh wow, you're angry and you need to play. I take the you out, I repeat, and I take the you out. And then we go into solution and strategies. So how could you meet your need for playing? How could you play? Well, maybe I should ask my friends. Oh yeah, right. So you see when they're small and they're not fully literate yet, we help them. As they get older, they become more and more autonomous using I statements and then uh, going into the strategies to meet their needs. Which uh, brings me to uh, this. Actually, I'm going to show you something else. Oh, where is the tech guy? He's gone. I don't know how to take this key out. I'm, I'm an, I work with Mac, so sorry. Would you mind putting this in? Oh, where are we in terms of time? Okay, perfect. Oh, you can take the other one out. Okay, any questions when it comes to the needs? Okay, needs are really, really amazing. Uh, there's um, good news and a bad news about needs. They're, they're fantastic. So Tara and I are using it for our program. Why? Because this method, this tool, is the one that trains the six cell components always. And it holds the three domains together. It's the most powerful emotional literacy we've come across. All the cell programs out there, and there are hundreds of them, will go through emotional literacy by developing a vocabulary of feelings. But there are no needs. We just stay with the feelings level. This is shared common humanity. This is also very much aligned with His Holiness's message of secular ethics. Because first I, I, I learned to use it with myself, but then I recognize that all human beings share the same needs. And in this sense, we're all the same. And if you know, we have conflicts, this is also the first tool we use for conflict resolution. This is the first tool we use for cooperative learning when things go wrong in a team and the teammates are fighting or they're having a problem. This goes in the three domains all the time. Just naming feelings does not achieve that. It just does that. Names feelings, it's fine. I'm getting better at understanding my feelings. But this, when I connect it to a need, also I regulate. <sighs> wow, I'm angry because I need respect. <sighs> now I get it. And then I can find a strategy which is appropriate to meet my need. And that's another thing you have to know. Feelings belong to us 100%. Okay, they're all my feelings. So if we have a fight and you say to me, well, you're not my friend anymore or I hate you, that triggers anger in me or sadness. This is the trigger, it's external. But anger and sadness, where is it? It's inside me. And if I wait for him to fix me, my anger and my sadness, it's not going to happen. Yes, he triggered something, but the feeling belongs to me. I have to manage it. The outside does not manage our feelings. But as human beings, we think it does. So I don't know why we grow up thinking that people out there are responsible for everything that happens to us and they're the ones who should fix it and he should know that I'm a good friend and why doesn't he say nice things to me? And then we get angry and sad, and, okay? So that's not good. So feelings belong to us and I'm in charge of managing that, whatever happens. Same thing with needs. So when it comes to my needs, they belong to me a hundred percent. If I'm angry and I need respect, well, I want him to respect me. He should know better. He should be nice to me and he should tell me nice things. What am I doing? I'm making him responsible for my needs. That's terrible. I'm going to suffer all my life. I'm going to be very sad for a long time when I think like this. And sadly, this is what we do a lot in our relationships. Without telling anyone, 
we're inside getting sad or upset because we think it's up to them to fix me. But when I know that my feelings belong to me and my needs, and I need respect, how am I going to meet that need? I'm going to have to do something about it. What can I do? So then, maybe I should go and talk to him. Maybe I should tell him how I'm feeling. Sorry, I'm using you secretly as my enemy right now. So, <laughs> so if I go and I say, okay, wow, I'm feeling angry, I need respect. I'm going to go talk to him. Good idea. Hey. I really don't like you anymore. You're not my friend and you've been so mean to me. Am I making an I statement now? Again, I'm making him responsible. I'm going to have to say, uh oh. You know what? Yesterday when we were playing, I felt really angry when you pushed me. And I need respect and safety. Can we talk about this? And then, yeah, he's like, okay. <laughs> but if I come pointing finger, you're bad, you push me, you don't respect me. Uh, do you want to talk to me? No, exactly. But if I say, whoa, I'm feeling, you know, angry and I'm scared. Yeah, yeah, it's all my, well, now something's happening. Oh, okay, so I'm going to get something out because this is where we are now. I'm going to show you my friends. Okay. Here are my friends. So in nonviolent communication, there are two types of languages. Oh, it's hard to do this with a mic. <laughs> Can somebody come and hold it for me? Yeah, yeah, come over here. Or anyone. Yeah. Okay. So in nonviolent communication that I'm gonna call NVC for short because I'm it's too long, there are two types of languages. And I know this looks silly. But trust me, the image is quite good. Speaking from your heart, NVC is also called compassionate communication. Actually, Marshall Rosenberg studied Gandhi and he really believed in nonviolent communication. At first, he called it like this, but later he realized this is actually more like compassion communication. Um, the giraffe image is because this is the animal which the largest heart on earth, it's a huge heart doesn't speak much, a little bit slow, takes her time. And this is the jackal. Like he's really like on the ground and looking for trouble all the time. This is the language of strong emotion. We all have a giraffe language and a jackal language inside of us. This is not bad, uh, careful. This is not bad, but this, leads to poor strategies. So this makes you statements all the time. Your fault. You're, you know, you should know. You should do this for me. This is really strong emotions, very quick, easy to use. You all use it all the time. I do. You know, this is more difficult. This takes time. Before we can make I statements, okay, thanks, now I'll, I'll use only one. Before we can make I statements, we need to regulate. I'm so angry, if I don't regulate, oh, it's happened again, you did it again, you're mean, I don't like you. How would you reply to me if I say that? Probably with this. Yeah, go for it, I mean, I'm getting my ears. <laughs> okay, you're not my friend anymore, I don't like you. That's my jackal ears. You're really mean. You keep pushing me in the schoolyard. Yeah. My fault. Come on, it's not my fault. It's your fault. Ah. Oh, okay. I still don't like you anymore. You're not my friend. And you know what? You're supposed to come to my house. You're not invited anymore. Oh, fine. Okay. So what's happening here? A jackal brings more jackal. We're, we're doing you statements. We're accusing the other and we're going for escalation. This thing is going to get worse. Now let's try to de-escalate. So let's, let's pretend we're both jackals. Okay, you're not my friend anymore. I really don't like you. You're mean. Okay. 
No, 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 you have to t speak in jackal again. Yeah, yeah, get your jackal out. I don't like you. Yeah, do speak in jackal with strong emotion. I don't like you. You're mean. Yeah, you're stupid. <laughs> okay, and now I'm like stepping back. Whew, I'm in the volcano right now. Really, like I think I've already exploded. So I know in the volcano, bad things are going to happen. I think we're both in the volcano right now. I'm going to take a, three deep breaths. And I'm going to go see how I'm feeling. All right. Yes, I'm angry. And you know what? I'm sad. Because, you know, we're usually good friends. And I think I need to... What do I need? I need friendship and to understand you a little bit more. I don't know what happened. So now I'm switching language. I didn't point fingers. I spoke about me. Do you think you can use the giraffe or you're still in jackal mode? <laughs> okay. What do we say in India? Dusty? Like dusty? Yeah, okay. So we're friends again? Okay, good. Okay. So this is a just a brief demonstration of what we call like giraffe jackal language. When I speak in strong emotions, pointing finger at what's happening outside, it just escalates. When I manage to translate, because that's a translation, we all have this, don't forget. When I translate in giraffe, well, now I'm connecting to me. I have, I'm aware what's going on for me. I acknowledge, yeah, I'm super angry. And I go connect to my need. Oh, yeah, really need to understand. You know, we're good friends. I want to understand what happened. I'm already regulating myself. I'm feeling much better. And then I can engage and say, okay, what's the solution? What can we do? So I'm going to show you. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if I have it. Oh, it's too long. I'm going to draw it on the board because um, I didn't think I was going to use it, but I, I think it's a good idea. Where's my pen? So, this is called a bonhomme in French. A bonhomme in French means the person. So here there's the head, the heart, and the feet balance. So, this is our little bonhomme. There are four steps in NVC. And so four steps you need to know to develop real giraffe language. The first one is the observation. The second one is the feelings. It's in the heart place. This is in the needs section. They, they're connected. And the last one is the request. Okay, so this is super powerful language for conflict resolution. So when Marshall Rosenberg designed this, he said, great, I have a good news and a bad news for you. So which one do you want first? The bad news? <laughs> oh, I, I, no, I have to go with the good news or else it's, it's more fun. <laughs> okay, so the good news is like, how simple can that be? This is so simple, four little steps. Observation, feeling, needs, request. Now the bad news. This is probably the hardest thing you'll ever learn in your life. <laughs> no kidding. Okay. Observation. Uh, Krishnamurti, if you're familiar with his work, said that observation is the highest form of human intelligence. And he's not kidding. Because an observation has to be neutral no feelings and needs. So observation, that's very hard. Then we connect to feelings and needs. 
And the last one is request. OK, so if I take back my little fight that I had before, I'm super upset. The teacher comes and sees that we're fighting. And the teacher says, so what's, what's the situation? Give me your observation. So I said, well, he's mean. He's pushing me. That's not an observation. What happened? We were playing. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and I fell down. That that's, that's, sounds very strange. But it's just like a camera would film a situation. OK, so this is what happened. OK, so then how am I feeling? I'm feeling angry and sad. What do I need? Friendship, respect, understanding what's going on. My request. So the re see, observation is at the head level. Feelings and needs. Needs is a balance. You know, it's, it's, in the, it's the middle. It's our hips. If we don't have this, we're out of balance. It's really important. The request is in the leg section. There's a reason for that. That means I'm in charge. I'm taking my legs, and I'm going to meet my need and say, are you? And a request goes like this. Would you be willing? Not, I want you to. Again, another you, another. I'm not forcing anything. I'm offering a solution. Would you be willing to talk to me about it? And you might say yes or no. A real request is when I can hear a no also. No, I don't want to. Fine, he's still in the volcano. You know, but I did my job. I tried to meet my need. And if this happens every day, and I don't get, I, f I find that my need for respect is not being met, I'm going to take my legs and go play with my friends here. You know, too bad. I'm not going to wait forever for him to be nice to me. You know, so I'm in charge of my needs. I have to meet my needs and find healthy strategies to meet them. OK? So just to go back a little bit to the observation. Um, can you see when I write at the back? Is it OK? OK. Do you have something to erase? Oh, OK, got it. Thanks. We, we will get more into this tomorrow. But today, I'm just giving you the, the very, very basics. So an observation is very difficult, especially when we're in strong emotions, in the middle of a conflict or something. Our emotions, we're going to kick in. And normally, we don't observe. We turn pretty much into a jackal or, and think the jackal is not bad. But my emotions will come up first. So. If I say, the red car is ugly, is that an observation? Or is that, uh, sorry, is that an observation or is that an interpretation? My interpreting. When I say, yes. If I say, the car is red, observation. Um, she's stupid, interpretation. Um, she dropped the glass. Yes, OK, so observation goes like this. An observation is what I see or what I hear. Sorry, that's an ear. <laughs> or what somebody says. So that's observation. The, these are the also. This is very powerful for conflict resolution. These are the basics for conflict resolution. What I see. I saw Sophie come up to Jane, put her hand on her shoulders. Jane fell. That's an observation. Or I saw Sophie being mean because she pushed. Not observation. There's mean. When we mix what we think. With, and how we feel with this, then we're, in it, we're doing an interpretation. So this is a brain. Sorry, I'm not very good at drawing. Brain plus how I feel plus what I see, heard, and what somebody says. That's interpretation. Or a judgment. I'm judging the situation based on how I'm feeling about it, OK? And observation is 
like the most important quality for you as teachers? Okay, we're quick, we take things personally, it's normal, we're human, but you need to develop this sense of observation so you can have a real, well, you can become and remain objective in the face of what happen, what's happening, either to your student or to yourself. Um, in our school, this is the message I always say to our teachers, you have to become good observers. And trust me, this is really hard practice. We're super quick, we judge, especially as adults, we think we're better, we're in charge. We are in charge, but don't confuse the two. You also need to understand the situation from a very objective point of view, or else you're gonna lose what's really going on. Like the little girl who came in the office looking very angry, and the principal first judge saying, angry, dis disrespectful kid. But actually, this is a girl that has a really deep issue about disliking herself and being so uh, worried about failing that her behavior is all wrong, but it looks different than what it is. Now that we know, we can address it properly. So become good observers. Um, just to make it one more time, what you see, what you hear. Sophie said, ah, Gishela is the stupidest Gishela on earth. This is, I said that, it was, I, repeat with, I repeated what I heard, it is an observation, okay, because I'm saying Sophie said dot dot, she's repeating, and then we're repeating this, um, what somebody has said, she said to me, I really hate you, you're not my friend, that's an observation, but I think she's stupid for doing that, that's my interpretation, <laughs> okay, so, so stick to a basic observation, and why is this important? Now I'm, I'm really a little bit, I'm giving you a little hint on conflict resolution. Because when there's a problem, and when we're in high emotions, trying to achieve conflict resolution on high emotion never works. But if like we're in a difficult situation, we really had a crazy fight, this has been going on forever, and we start like, yeah, but he did that and she does this. We're bringing, we're escalating the emotions. But if I start on a neutral ground where we both agree that I've been playing with other people for the last few weeks and I'm not been, I haven't been talking to you and we, we go from basic observation, then we can get into the feelings and needs. But first we have to find a common ground without emotions and without judgment, especially judgments and interpretation. Then we can talk about our feelings and needs then we can try to find a solution by making requests mutually. Okay? Any questions on this? Hmm? I, want to I want you to stress that point once more. One more, once more. Which one? The whole four steps? Okay. The request? Okay. So, conflict resolution. Actually, this model is also super important for intervention. If something happened in a school, you have to intervene with some students. You're going to go with this. Okay, so you're going to ask the student observation. And you as an adult are responsible for not bringing in interpretation. Even though this has been happening for the 10,000th time and you're really fed up, you put that behind you, you regulate it, and you're like, okay, what's the observation? Then we can talk about the feelings and needs. Because now with an observation already, we're a little bit more regulated. Feelings and needs will help us regulate even more. Everybody's feelings and needs. When we connect to the needs, this is where we can try to find solution and make a request. We don't base our request on our emotion. We base them on our core human values. Okay, so when we find our needs, then we make a request. And often in the worst scenarios that I've seen in my school, the worst kind of conflict you can possibly imagine, most of the kids have the same needs. And, and, and it's quite, we do, it's really fun doing conflict resolution with this because it brings a lot of sense of humor, deflates a lot of the tensions like, oh my goodness, I've got three needs for respect here. <laughs> How are we gonna do this? Yeah, we're all the same, we all want respect right away we will be able to find a solution. But we're never going to do that in the high emotions. Okay? Is that good? 
All right. It's almost time to finish. Um, do you mind if we finish a little bit later because I came late? Is it OK? Because I have one silly game again. And one more game. OK. So any questions on nonviolent communication? We've gone really quick on this. Uh, any questions about this? No? OK. So um, homework. I don't like to call it homework. No. Fun work. <laughs> so before you come out tonight, I want you to take uh, one of these. Oh, do you want to distribute? So uh, maybe we need more help. I, everybody gets one of these two. Yeah, you can just pass it around. So today you're going to get this is uh, the, you saw the, the children doing feelings and needs cards. So the poster is for younger children, but actually I've used it with adults. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I would encourage you to use it too. I, I don't have enough copy. We, maybe we can organize to have 20, 25 more. Maybe you'll get it in black and white, but you will have the poster. Everybody gets these. So there's 15 feelings and needs. This, this we designed for kindergartners, and there are the six basic emotions um, if you're familiar with that, there are six, the, some scientists, Paul Ekman and others, recognize that all human beings have six basic emotions. So, surprise, anger, sadness, disgust, joy, and what, what am I forgetting? Sadness, okay? So, the six basic emotions are here, and then... What has been added is all the emotions we normally see with kindergartners. So we, we're working with what comes up most often with children. There's a question mark on both posters. This is for the emotions that are not on the posters because there's obviously way more emotions than just 15. Same thing for needs. We've been working with what we see in classes happen more often. So you have 15 basic uh, needs but they're way more than that. These cards are what we give starting grade two, 20 feelings, 20 needs. So you're gonna work with that. This is gonna be your material. Uh, if you have a pair of scissors tonight, cut them out. So you have two sets of cards and write your name behind it because we're gonna play with them and it's crazy when we start mixing them up, we lose everything. So write your name behind each card tonight, okay? Uh, what else do I need to give you? Oh, we need to distribute these. I'm going to keep this. Oh, hang on. I've got more. I have some more needs post. Uh, what should we do? Do you want to leave this here? So, or, or can you share amongst yourselves? I don't know. You took a photo? Oh, take a photo. Perfect. That's a better idea. Okay. Anyway, I have some more over here. Okay. <clears throat> so for tonight, please read the article. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm using your desk here. So this is, again, a book by Dan Goldman. His introduction, I didn't photocopy the whole book, it's quite thin, but this is the most important bit. So read about this. Every night from now on, every day, I want you to go through your feelings and list needs. And uh, please write them in Tibetan under if you want, that would be great. So tonight when you go home, think about the situation during the day and put down how you're feeling and what you were needing. It could be, I'm feeling happy, it meets my need to learn, something positive. Or it could be uh, angry, and think about anger as a family here, you know, because <laughs> I was explaining, feelings are a bit like onions, there are many layers. Tomorrow we'll talk about the families, but if you're frustrated, you're gonna put angry, and maybe see what you were needing, okay? So you start, today learning about your feelings and needs. Uh, it took me three years 
Yes, and I'm not kidding. It took me three years. When I started nonviolent communication, three years to become fluent again. So I know this is not easy. It looks simple. It's not. I was confusing feelings with needs. Is that a feeling to be heard? Is that a feeling or is that a need? Um, I was mixing everything up. It took me a long time. So for three years, I had a list next to my bed. And every time <laughs> before going to bed, I would read my feelings and needs. And as you do that, you will develop your own emotional literacy. OK, so tomorrow, when after you cut all your cards, bring them back with you every day because we might do some games with them. OK, now I think I gave you everything. Yeah, OK. All right, so now we're going to finish with a game. We need to move a little bit. This game is called Sticky Feelings. Sticky Feelings. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly what it is. So you're going to, oh, I'll put you, let me put a list on the board since I don't know where they've gone. I'm going to try to, this is, I have no idea where these lists have gone. I have two packs of feelings and needs for you with like very much more elaborate lists and on the way here, I just lost them. Can, can I see this whole page in one go? Okay, while we try to fix this, you're going to get a sticky... I'm going to try... I have to find where these went, because I, I have some for you. Uh, so, you know, with children, we've got 15 feelings and needs. Older children, 20. I have an extra set of cards for kids, you know, from, 10, uh, from 12 to 18. And this is even more complex, because there's a couple of hundred words in there. What I want you to do is take one sticky note, and write a feeling on it. And when you're done, come and give me the sticky note. And OK? If you want, you can come up to the front and look at the needs list, uh, the feelings list. Try not to put something simple, because I'm going to show you how you're going to play. Can you help me? So let's, this is the sticky feeling part. So. I wrote, let's say that it's written happy here. But she doesn't know, because it's stuck here <laughs> on her back. And so she comes up to me. So what's your name? Tenzin Dijen. So Dijen comes up to me, and I go, ah, OK. I'm not going to say, oh, it's written happy. Right, you guessed. So I'm going to say, and I'm trying to give her cues so she gets the feeling. Yeah, easy. But let's say she hadn't, she, you didn't find it first, and I can say, I just gave you a wonderful gift. How are you feeling? Uh, not quite. And then, so I try once, and then if you don't get it, you go see someone else. And when you have it, you take it off, and then you come and give it back to me. We're going to go play outside, because we need space. OK? So everybody gets it. You can come to my computer. Take a sticky note, they're here. Actually, it would really be good that you write it in English and Tibetan. Please write both. OK? Hindi? <laughs> hmm? Is what? Many of them may not follow Hindi. Tibetan is important because I want you to start thinking about your own list, because we're going to have to come up with our list in Tibetan, not just a 15. It's Okay, did you find your feeling? There, there's some lists coming. I found them. They were in my other bag. I'm still very jet lagged. I got up at one. Uh, in this list that you just got, it, the feelings are organized in families. Thank you so much. So. Yes. One. Only write one feeling. And so in yellow, you can see feelings we have when our needs are met, and the other ones when our needs are not met, and sometimes both. Like surprise could be a bad surprise, or it could be a good surprise. OK, so when you've 
you've written your your feeling come uh, and give it to me or I'm gonna go around and, and collect them it's better like that are you done hmm? and it's okay if you write a feeling that you don't know the definition of if, if it's a feeling you don't understand perfect because that's gonna make somebody's life harder we want this to be hard and you know when we develop literacy with the children this is a good excuse to develop vocabulary also we're developing vocabulary. So choose difficult feelings that you don't understand. That will make us work harder. Yeah? Got it? Okay. Oh, good. Oh, that's going to be tough. Ooh. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Oh, my goodness. How are we going to do this one? <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is going to be a fun game. That's going to be hard. I think this is going to take more than five minutes. Okay, do I have everybody's feelings? It doesn't work. It won't work. Well, let's try it. See what happens. <laughs> Ooh, that's tough. Okay, got everything? Okay, you, yeah, you got it? Okay. Oh, who wrote this one? Is this yours? Because I have to stick. I'll write again. Can you write uh, happy here? No, 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 no. No, it's just that when I stick it, we, can't, we have to read. So if, you, if you've written on the sticky side, then we won't see. I'll have to write again. Oh. Uh, wait, I'll find. Oh, okay. Okay, so how, what we're going to do is, as you walk out, one by one, like first graders, I'm going to stick one on your back. You don't know what's written. We're going to go out in the garden, and then you're going to start to figure out what's stuck, what kind of sticky feeling you have on your back, okay? When you find out, come and give it to me. At the end, we're going to have a few people who can't figure it out because it's too hard. So then we'll make a circle, and as a large group, we're going to try to help them. And if we can't find it, then, then we'll tell what it is. There's always feelings that are too hard to guess, so that's normal. So does everybody understand? Yeah? Okay. So this is the sticky feeling game. So come and line up, and we're, I'm going to stick this on your back. Uh, one more thing, use as many people as possible, like if I ask uh, Detena and she gives me a clue and I don't get it, I go see someone else, okay, because we're stretching also our relationship skills while doing this, okay, we're doing self-awareness, we're doing regulation, I don't want you to be too excited and overdo it, and we're te testing our relationship skills, okay. So we don't have access to the garden right now, so we're going to just do it outside the room. <laughs> 